Show. I am your host, Jay Jones. Black Entrepreneur Blueprint was created specifically to educate and inspire black entrepreneurs to launch, build, and grow successful businesses. Join us as we help build an economic power base in the black community by promoting business ownership. If you are currently an entrepreneur or want to be an entrepreneur, we invite you to join us every week here at Black Entrepreneur Blueprint. Welcome to the Black Entrepreneur Blueprint, episode number 309. I'm your host, Jay Jones, and today, family, we have an outstanding show in store for you. Today's show topic is how to buy franchises to create generational wealth. And we're going to be joined by a mother and daughter team of Ms. Toya Evans, Lauren Williamson, and Chanel Grant of TLC Hospitality and Healthy Living Ventures. Now, today's show is amazing, guys, because I get a lot of people to ask me about buying franchises. So you definitely want to tune in today. So as of right now, uh, TLC Hospitality owns three Tropical Smoothie Cafe franchises, one hand in stone massage and facial franchise and they are in the process of building a choice hotel in goldsboro north carolina that's going to be a sleep in and a mainstay suites so they've taken it from the standard retail franchises now stepping up to the hotel franchise business so please stay tuned for this amazing interview with tlc hospitality toya evans lauren williamson and chanel grant now, before we jump into today's episode, I just want to share a few things with the BEB family. First and foremost, I want to welcome all first-time listeners to Black Entrepreneur Blueprint. Welcome to the BEB family, and please stick around until the end of today's broadcast, and I'm going to share all my social media information and my resource links, such as the link to my new book, A New Black Wall Street, also two platforms that I use to circulate dollars in the black community, BeSmartByBlack.com and HireBlackFreelancers.com, and I'll give you all that information at the end of today's show. Let's get ready for the interview. BEB family, I am live with Miss Lauren Williamson, uh, Chanel Grant, and Mom Toya Evans from TLC Hospitality. How are you ladies doing this morning? We are doing great. Thanks for having us. You know what? This is funny. This is the first time I've had this many people on one of our actual YouTube videos, so... Bear with me because I know I know it's going to be a good one. So <laughs> now for all of my Black Entrepreneur Blueprint family members who aren't familiar with TLC Hospitality, which is your company, can you just give us a little background on each of you and then we'll go into your entrepreneurial story. So I, I want to start with mom first. Toya, if you can. Hi, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> morning. So my background is primarily in the technology world. I spent uh, over 25 years working for companies like Microsoft, America Online, General Electric, and and product management, strategy development, and just transitioning to do something different. All right. Appreciate that. Now, I don't know who's older between the the young ladies, Chanel and Lauren. Who's the oldest? There we go. I like that spirit right there. (laughs) Younger. (laughs) I am older. I will go next. I'm Lauren Williamson. Um, I have spent the last 14 years in the tech world uh, doing global sales strategy um, for a large technology firm, as well as sales um, marketing, got my degree from Old Dominion University uh, in marketing, and then went on to uh, start this journey into technology. I will say Toya was being very humble when she spoke about just being in corporate, because she is definitely a serial (laughs) uh, you know, small business owners. So growing up, Chanel and I spent so many hours (laughs) working in the businesses that her and my dad had. So whether that be from custom closets, which um, she was able to grow from, you know, start all the way up to like a million dollar business to 
you know, a janitorial business. So not only do we have corporate experience, but I would definitely say I grew up, you know, owning small businesses as well. Oh, that's amazing. And she likes to tell the child labor law stories. So. The child labor <laughs> laws, yes. Hey, look, we won't, we, we won't put those on, on film. So we'll talk about that after, the, after the fact. Right. Miss Chanel, you're up next. Yes, my name is Chanel Grant, and I have been in pharmaceutical sales and marketing for the last nine years. I, too, went to Old Dominion University, followed Lauren, um, and went to the same college, but <laughs> right after school, got into pharmaceutical sales, and I've been doing that now for the last nine years, and okay. now entrepreneurial you know, background as well. Cool. All right, so we want to touch base will start off that you guys own multiple franchises and also are developing a hotel. But I just want to touch on something that you, you guys brought up. Um, Lauren, you had mentioned that your parents were entrepreneurs when you guys were little. So Toya, can you speak to what made you go out? So, well, let me rephrase this. So were you still in corporate and continued to be an entrepreneur on the side when you started Toya? Yes. In the beginning, their dad and I, we started, uh, a computer service business that was the first thing that we did and really taking advantage of uh that's ages me a bit the novelty <laughs> <laughs> don't feel bad most, most people weren't getting computers and then when they were they didn't know how to set them up they didn't know how to load the applications etc and their dad is also in technology so we started that business first and then we just evolved because uh i listened to your podcast about uh the eight things that you should learn from covid and one of them was you know you need to have multiple revenue streams and so that's always been a thing of ours. And even though we were working and we had, you know, very high paying jobs in technology, we always wanted to have something that, you know, if something came up or as we like to say, they didn't like the color of our shirt that day or we were rising <laughs> that, you know, we were not going to, you know, have a fit if we were no longer associated with those great companies that we, that we said. So we always had something going on. And one story they didn't tell is they were, uh, we started them on their entrepreneurial journey because they actually planned out from art design and, oh, wow. and looking for products to add. They were going to do uh, a kid's uh, cosmetic thing called Cool Kids. And oh, so they wow. worked with the artists <laughs> and they were probably in maybe fifth grade, mm -hmm. fifth or sixth grade in kindergarten. And they had their art designer working with them on their logo. We wow. had sourced because we were already in the chemical business. Uh, for shampoos and conditioners and things of that nature for them. So it's just been a while. We wanted to always show them that while you might be working for someone, that didn't define you, that you could go out and do your own thing too. Exactly. That's beautiful. Um, one of the things that I want the BEB family to take note of, so when you look at Toya, Lauren, and Chanel, this is something that's generational in terms of entrepreneurship. And I speak about this all the time. I was on a, uh, interviewed on a podcast and they asked me about uh, my children teaching children entrepreneurship. So I have a, a similar story when my girls were 10 and seven, they're 24 and 21 now. When they were 10 and seven, you know how Uggs were real popular back in the day? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, oh man, every Christmas, you know, dad, we need a new pair of Uggs. And it just got to the point where I think they probably had about six or seven pairs of peaks. And so I, I told my wife, I said, you know, this, this is getting a little crazy here. And <laughs> I said, the girls need to start understanding that, um, you know, things just don't grow on trees. You know, yeah, we're, 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 we're okay. Everything is good. But I said, you need to start how, learning how to understand to make your own money. So I called up a minor league baseball team that's right outside of Philadelphia there in Delaware. It's called the, uh, the Blue Rocks. And so it's about 30 minutes south of Philly. And I asked him, I said, um, do you have any vendor opportunities for people that wanted to start a water ice business? In New York, they call it Italian ice, but you guys are in Maryland, so like readers, stuff yeah, like that. Water ice. Yeah. So they were like, oh, we'd love to talk to you. So we brought the girls down there, myself and my girls. And I said, all right, come to the meeting so you can see how this works. And so we ended up signing a contract. I spent $7,000 for a cold cart. And uh, which would stay cold during the games. And that first year, uh, we branded it. Uh, we gave 10% of our proceeds to uh, National Children's Cancer Society. And the first year, we did 41 home games. And I think we, we netted over $30,000. And so I used to let them count the money at the end of the night so they could see 
you know, like a thousand or two thousand dollars. I mean, it's not a lot of money, but for a seven and ten year old, it's a whole lot of money. Yes. So, yeah. So, awesome. and and the beautiful thing about that, ladies, was that we were doing so well. Uh, the DC United soccer team um, actually invited us to come and get another car. So, dad had to spend another seven grand, get another <laughs> car. And now we're in DC, we're in Delaware. It was crazy. And we did it for about three years. But um, I love the fact that you included your daughters in your business. So that way they would have that exposure. So I, I definitely kudos. And I know you guys are going to continue to take it and, and move it forward as, as you I guys. Think, I think it's so important, especially for our community to see that it's bigger than just yourself. So we talk a lot about mentoring, et cetera. I know we'll probably get to that, but even mm -hmm. down to the children's level, I mean, I have a seven and six year old and just having them involved in our businesses right now, whether that be from the tropical smoothie franchise or understanding the hotel. I always, I share the story of my son where we were driving through the Chick-fil-A line and he's mm -hmm. like, man, it's always a line at Chick-fil-A. When I get older, I want to work here. <laughs> and I was like, well, honey, let's break that down real quick. Like, you actually, you want to own the Chick-fil-A. Like, that's what you would want to do. And here's why. So we started talking about just the numbers associated on, if you work there, this is what this looks like. But if you own it. And he was like, oh, I get it. That's why you guys want to buy all these franchises. I'm like, yes, the numbers. Start to so even if you think about it at seven, your brain starts to think you are planting these small seeds in young children that hopefully when they grow up they will then do the same so i think it's uh, you know kudos to you for doing the same with your girls but yeah mm -hmm. i'm trying to instill the same in my children yeah that's 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 great and we definitely need that as a as a community um i wanted to step back a little bit so all of you guys are in corporate right now and what made you decide to go out and tell us about your first franchise and what made you guys decide to come together to do that Okay, I'll start. So I'm actually not working in corporate anymore. Oh, okay. Um, we have so much going on. It got to be that somebody had to step off first. So okay. I'm the first one to start. And I had a very uh, demanding job, I'll say that. And mm -hmm. the young ladies would hate that every time they call me during the day or whatever, I hit that can't talk right now. <laughs> right now. And it drove them crazy because uh, I would be in meetings or be on a flight somewhere uh, all over the country. And sometimes like the, an east to west coast trip in one day. Wow. Uh, and so they said, well, we really need to stop this and think about some uh, businesses that we could do together and, and that could grow. And so we just started to brainstorm. We would have these calls at night and someone would bring three or four different ideas. And then we started to say, well, why don't we just do a franchise now? Because everybody's working. Right. We get a blueprint it'll be a little bit easier than us trying to start from scratch, which is what they, they saw their dad and I do all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, so um, that's what we did. And we just started to look at things that spoke to us and we said, let's do something healthy because way back, I think Chanel must have been, had a vision when she was maybe in middle school. And she said, you know, when I, when I grow up, I'm going to have a health and wellness business. And then Lauren began to play off of that. And it was, well, yeah, we could do this with it and we could serve, you know, healthy juices and this, et cetera. And here we are now in hospitality and food services and who knew. But um, once we started to evaluate the different uh, types of franchises, um, Tropical Smoothie was the one that we decided to go with. It was one with, that was familiar to us. They had one at Old Dominion University. So the girls were familiar with it from school, but also we lived in uh, the Northern Virginia area was there mm -hmm. and they had a great support system. And more importantly, their values really spoke to us. It, it aligned to some of the things that we were about. Uh, and so we said, let's do it. Right. And that's, that's how we went with the first one. For me, it was big when we started talking about just looking at those opportunities, I really wanted to diversify my portfolio. So when I looked at just how much heavily I rely on that corporate salary, um, mm -hmm. I didn't want that feeling. I feel like I wanted something where if tomorrow they decided they were doing layoffs or tomorrow they decided that they didn't need me anymore in that position, that I wouldn't, my world wouldn't fall apart. My children would still be able to go to the school they go to. We would still be able to afford our home. And it would be because I had diversified my portfolio, not because I was just relying on corporate. So that was one of the big things for me as we started to look at opportunities on, okay, what's going to make it so that we are not relying on our full-time jobs? 
that makes a lot of sense. Chanel, did you want to add anything to that? Well, I was just going to say another thing that played, another factor that played a role was that we had moved from Northern Virginia to Prince George's County. Um, and we looked around in the community and we saw no healthy food options. Wow. Like there was just Popeyes and McDonald's and, you know, different things like that. And, you know, back in Northern Virginia, where we lived before, you could find a smoothie on every corner. Right. And so we saw that as an opportunity to bring healthy food options to our community that we now live in. And it's been so well received, um, you know, from the Prince George's County community. And we were actually were the fifth tropical smoothie to open um, in Prince George's County. And with a, another brand that we're involved in, Hand in Stone, will be the first to open in Prince George's County. So we're excited about just bringing these options to the community as well. That's, yeah, that's amazing because we definitely need some positive, uh, positive food options there. So when you say Popeyes, that, that hit a nerve with me, right? right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, that whole situation with Popeyes and, and the uh, chicken sandwich, I, for the life of me, I, I, I don't understand it. And I, I, I talked about it on one of the shows and I was, I was perturbed because why do you give that much shine to a, to a chicken sandwich? I said, I said, if you're using social media, why don't you shout out some black owned businesses? You know how much press that they got for free? You know, the traction that they got. And we'll sit in the line for a freaking chicken sandwich for an hour, but you won't sit in the line to vote. And so that's a whole nother show topic, guys. I, I can get on a rant right now. But <laughs> I felt it coming. Yeah. <laughs> I'm but I agree you, with you though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's crazy. It's crazy. Um, so your first uh franchise was Smoothie King. So how many Smoothie Kings do you have right Tropical now? Smoothie Cafe. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we'll X that out. Tropical, <laughs> Tropical Smoothie Cafe. I'm sorry. <laughs> how many do you guys have right now? So we opened okay. our first store in October of 2016. That was in Bowie, Maryland. Okay. Uh, we actually opened up our second store in the middle of COVID. Oh, wow. Uh, so very interesting uh, situation, but we opened on May 9th, our second store. And we have a third store in development that will okay. open in about the next 60 days. So okay. a lot going on all at once. Wow. Um, yeah, but. Okay. Where's your third uh, store going to be? It's actually a non-traditional location. So okay. not your typical brick and mortar. It's um, on an Air Force base. So Andrews oh, Air cool. Force Base. Oh, that's great. That's great. All right. Now, you also mentioned that you have a uh, hand in stone massage uh, and facial. Okay. What made you guys to switch, uh, not switch, but to venture into that type of vertical versus the, the food vertical that you're currently in? So there were a couple of reasons. One is that Tropical Smoothie began to sell out in Maryland quite okay. a bit. Um, and so that just had our wheels turning of kind of where else we wanted. When we first started, we wanted six. Tropical okay. smoothies. That was our goal. Um, and, you know, locations kind of began to sell out. So we had to start thinking outside the box, like where else, how else can we grow with this brand, which is what led us to looking at some non-traditional locations. Okay. Um, and it looks like as if we will get to six in that DMV area, which is great. Um, but that initial uh, idea of it being sold out made us just start thinking like, well, what else do we like? What other kind of brands would make sense in our portfolio? Again, as Toya had mentioned earlier, the name of our business is Healthy Living Ventures. Okay. So everything that, every brand that we get involved with, we want it to fall under that healthy living, healthy, you know, lifestyle um, idea. So we just started again, brainstorming, went back to the drawing board um, and said, you know, what brand would make sense in our portfolio? We all love massages and spas and facials. And we have since we were little too, <laughs> as my mom mentioned. So it, that was like, it made sense, um, you know, as the next step. I think and one of the things you always say Chanel too is looking at re recession proof type things. And while massage isn't 100% recession proof, it's still more of a luxury, but right. still trying to figure out things that couldn't be replaced by the internet. So right. when you look at food options, while there's Grubhub and Uber Eats now that can deliver that food for you, you still need a brick and mortar location that can deliver the food. Um, right. You can't get a massage via the internet. So it's something <laughs> that you would still need to be um, going into the facility for. So looking for options that couldn't be disrupted by technology, but almost enhanced by technology. For sure. 
That's a, um, we were planning on pandemic, so we'll have to right. add that to our criteria now <laughs> yes. as we evaluate businesses. It, uh, you're right. Because, yeah, it's, I mean, this is a, we're at a, a point in time now where, well, if we're here in the States, that this has never happened before. So I always talk about on one of, I can't even remember which podcast because I got, what, 306 of them out now. But I talk about having businesses in a good economy, a bad economy, and a neutral economy. So if you can have revenue streams in all three economies, you'll be in good shape. Um, I, I wanted to ask you guys, because I know this is going to be a big question. So one of the things about the BEB family, they're very responsive and they'll, they'll DM me, they'll email me. And I know if I don't leave this interview without asking you guys about financing, I'm in trouble, right? So, <laughs> so a lot of times uh, when you hear franchises, and we'll get to the Choice Hotel in a minute, because that's a whole nother level to the game there. Um, yes. How did you guys franchise? I mean, how did you guys finance your franchises? So I would like you... to say it was not at all the, the easy route. Um, okay. <laughs> I'll let Toya speak on the franchise, on the, the financing portion of it. But I think okay. the one thing I would leave all of the listeners and viewers to say is sometimes you have to go a non-traditional route to go about your dream um, and not to be turned off by a no. And we talk a lot about this and I know we'll get to the franchising course that we put together, mm -hmm. but really a no is not always a no. And it's kind of been our model on, you know, every time we would reach out to a lender, we would keep hearing no, sorry, no, 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 we can't give you funding. And we would go back to the board after that. And even, you know, obviously sometimes those no's can get frustrating. We'd say, okay, let's pivot then. How are we going to go about getting the financing for this? So that would be one of my takeaways for sure. That's why I'll let you okay. handle that one. Yeah, so we, we'll talk about financing, uh, I'll say, in a traditional way and a non-traditional way. Okay. So if you look at, you want to go out and you buy, want to buy a franchise and you work with a franchisor, more than likely, uh, if they're one of the uh, a more established brand, they're going to have connections with banks right. that will do a loan for you. They already know the brand, they vetted it, they understand how the, what the business model looks like, and they're comfortable, you know, banking that business. So that would either be, you know, a conventional route where you'd have to put, you know, a certain amount of equity down, or they might say you can go in the SBA, SBA route. Right. So if you're buying a franchise, that's typically going to be, you know, you'll fall into one of those buckets. Okay. Uh, depending on where you are, I'll say in your life, if you have, you know, access to a very large 401k and you're looking to leave corporate America, then mm -hmm. there's, you know, the new program, which is the ROBS program. Right. Um, and a lot of people will use their own 401k to finance their business. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that would be an option. Okay. So if you're, if you're going that route, you know, you just have to have your, your equity. So the question right. becomes, you know, depending on if you're going conventional, you might have to have maybe up to 20% of the total right. cost of the budget. You might be able to do it with less if it's SBA. Right. Okay. So in our case, the reason we didn't fit into that model, because again, you have three corporate women making very high salaries. So you would right. say, oh yeah, great. Just go write a check. You're good. Right. Uh, <laughs> however, <laughs> I'm the high over in this equation because it okay. wasn't the two, the, the two girls, but their dad and I had a business. Uh, that was the last business that we started together that was doing incredibly well. Mm -hmm. And I signed off on a lot of loans and he decided he didn't want to do the business anymore. And he basically walked out. Okay. And so at that time, I'm the person left holding the bag. And so because of that, one of those, one of those bags happened to be an SBA um, gotcha. loan. And so we found out, you know, we'd already signed a franchise agreement and everything. And, wow. and they sent us to their lender and they're like, oh, great. Yeah, this looks great. Look, oh, look on paper. They've got great jobs. They've got great income. They've mm. got the equity. This is a slam dunk. Right. And I get this phone call from the lender saying, hey, um, did you have an SBA loan before? And I didn't even remember. Right. And so you have a business before. And so he says, well, now you're not going to ever be able to get an SBA loan again. Wow. So I think about a big balloon and you just put a pin in it right, right. <laughs> and all the air comes out. And you didn't mention that the lease was signed as well. Remember? Oh, yes. <laughs> we were, we were knee deep. Oh my goodness. <laughs> right. I wow. forgot that part. Yeah. We wow. signed the lease, which we all guaranteed, you know, with our personal <laughs> guarantee on our houses were on the line. Right. And we'd signed the franchise agreement. And so uh, they said, well, you're, you're not going to be able to get an SBA loan. And so I remember I had gone out to my car to have the call. And I sat in the car 
and I had about a, uh, Lauren's husband now says that we don't give anybody time to have a pity party. It was about a three minute pity party. <laughs> we said, okay, we're going to have to find another way to do this. Right. And literally got on the phone and I just started, you know, going through, um, looking at county programs, uh, city programs, state programs, anything that looked like an SBA loan, but it was really looking for minority and women-owned businesses that they would offer funding. And that's how we put it together. We had to end up putting more of our cash in than we had anticipated because initially with the uh, SBA loan, they said they wanted us to put 20% down. So right. we were only planning to put up 60 grand. Gotcha. We ended up putting up, I think, 91 or 92,000. And okay. then we were going to finance the rest. So we were able to get um, a micro loan um, loan from the state of Maryland, um, the city of Bowie, where our okay. first, our franchise is located. They put up money oh, for wow. us to be, uh, in Bowie, and then we also got money from Prince George's County Economic Development uh, Council, oh, wow. and that's how we brought it together. That's great. And so yeah. we, that's why we say, you know, no doesn't mean no. Like I sat in that car for a minute, you know, you right. kind of <laughs> hit that steering wheel, like I'm going to, we signed all this stuff away. Right. And it's like, okay, but we're going to still do it anyway. Um, and I, I, I really love that podcast that I listened to that I was telling you about your eight, because I think in one of the things you say in there is that just because we're in COVID and right. you had dreams about being a business, don't pause now. Exactly. You got to put the pedal to the metal and keep it moving. Exactly. And that's what we said, you know, okay, well, we're not going to get an SBA loan. All right, but we're still going to do it. Right. And the funny thing is, tropical smoothie. They once they hear, because you know the franchisors, they're like, okay, we just want an easy path too. Right. Okay, we've <laughs> right. got we, we've got somebody. They have you know, a good net worth. They have mm -hmm. the equity in it. They know what a franchise is. Oh, they're perfect. Right. And so once they got the pause, they're like, oh, okay. Uh oh. <laughs> I know you didn't. I know you didn't say to me you want to do six because you can't even do one. Right. Um, and they kind of they had a pause for a few moments, but they they got on board and like Chanel said, we have number three, and they've already called us about number four. So they see now that you know we don't take no for an answer, and we we move forward. So it worked out. So you know, financing can always be the one that's the thing that's going to scare you away, mm -hmm. but it really shouldn't because okay. there's just so many other ways I could go. We could have a whole podcast just on all the ways you can kind of bootstrap and pull something together so if you really want to do it i would tell anybody just do it and and keep calling and don't take no i'd also say just to piggyback off of that too the hardest thing from financing is getting the first store okay. and i know we talk about that a lot uh, but getting the first store is going to be the hardest step so if you can bootstrap it together with the county programs that toya mentioned or in most cases you know getting an sba loan to get it off the ground once you can show that proven success with the first store, the mm -hmm. next store start to come. Yeah. Now banks want to work with you. They've seen that you can, you've proven that you can do a tropical smoothie. Right. We are now not getting the calls from lenders saying, oh, no, we don't want to work with your tropical smoothie brand anymore because they see what we've done with the first one. So really just hunkering down, I think, from a financing standpoint, deciding what's in your life that you can give up and sacrifice for a small period of time so that you can get to the ultimate goal, which is owning your business. So there's less trips maybe in that first year when you're trying to <laughs> save that money. You're not going out shopping as much. You're kind of cutting back in some areas mm -hmm. um, so that you can make your dream come true. That's what I, I traded in my BMW for a Jeep Cherokee. There that you was go. one of the things I had to get rid of. <laughs> <laughs> that sacrifice right there. Love that car, but it had to go. It had to go. <laughs> well, 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 you know, one of the questions I was going to ask you ladies was to tell us about a time that you were struggling because no business just goes from zero to 100 without some struggle and how you overcame it. So that actually answered that for us. And so I want the light bulb to go off to the BEB family. So anything that's worthwhile is going to take effort. And so I like what you said about uh, alternative financing and finding a way around, through, under, whatever, to get the objective done. And I think a lot of prospective entrepreneurs um, have issues or new entrepreneurs have issues when they see these roadblocks. But if it was easy, everybody would do it. So I commend you ladies on continuing to push forward because a lot of people, they would have stopped right there. Oh man, we're done. Uh, you know, we can't do it anymore. And uh, it's crazy. Um, I wanted to ask you guys, too, uh, about family businesses. Uh, Toya, you have mentioned something with 
your husband and, you know, about, you know, you were stuck on the leases and everything like that. What is your advice to the Black Entrepreneur Blueprint family about doing business with your family? And I'm going to ask all three of you guys, and I'll start with mine first. Well, I, I would say that just because you're family doesn't mean you're going to make a good business partner. Right. Um, so that would be it. So you just can't say, oh, I'm going to do business with my brother or my sister or my husband, right. and you think it's going to work. Right. Because it, it is another relationship that you're adding on top of the family. Right. right? So you, you can't get rid of being family, but you can get rid of a business partner. Right. Definitely. So I think that it's, it's a, a way to make sure that as you're going to vet that that family member that's going to share your same vision, they're going to be ready to put in the grind with you mm -hmm. um, or whatever you guys agree. Maybe, they, maybe they're not going to put in the grind. They're just going to put up the money right. on to help you, but they see where you're going and they want to be a part of it. And, and then keep it, the, keep it separate. Like these girls, we talk, I don't know how they have their <laughs> own. We all have our own individual five or 10 calls a day. And right. then collectively, we may have five or 10 calls a day with each other, all on a three-way. Right. Uh, we're texting all day. And it's not all about business. It gotcha. could be, you know, yesterday, Lauren sharing, um, or the other day, my granddaughter doing her presentation on jellyfish. Yeah, yeah, she's homeschooling. Jelly. And right. then the next minute, it will be like, oh, my God, we need to respond to this thing for here or did you get this call out or did you get this paperwork over to this person so we kind of go back and forth but at the end of the day mm -hmm. uh we're gonna go to a happy hour or go on a trip and not talk at all about business i hear you because you no know, we're mothers and daughters and friends first we just happen to be business partners who, who who have a shared vision on what we're trying to do not just for the three of us but for their children and their children's children and that's make that makes a difference so when they get stuff i just take a break for a minute um mm -hmm. yeah we'll, we'll get back to that in a minute um and then we'll just do mom and daughter or sister and sister gotcha okay how about you chanel I, you take? She, she said it all honestly okay. the, <laughs> having that shared vision and just making sure that you all are going to put in the same amount of work uh, you know a lot of times it's that sweat equity um, in mm -hmm. the beginning, or if you're not going to put in that same sweat equity, make sure that that's just communicated a, ahead of time. And then definitely being having the ability just to keep the relationship separate or as separate as you can. Mm -hmm. And when things are tough or you're re very frustrated, just taking a break for sure. Um, so I think you hit, hit it all, Toya. Okay. Lauren, did you want to add anything to that? I think communication is pretty important. So I wouldn't get into business with anyone who I couldn't communicate with well. And I think they mentioned just putting in the same. And I don't know if I would necessarily agree that we all put in the same at all times, but having that communication level, right? Chanel's getting ready to have a baby. We're going to open probably two stores at that time. So during that time, we're going to kind of pick up that bag for her while she's doing that, where my job has been pretty demanding lately. So one of the things that I handle for our stores is the human resources portion where onboarding. So Chanel has stepped in for me and she's been doing a lot of the interviews right now. I taught her how to send out the hire letters so that she can pick up while I'm doing a lot of conference calls right now and homeschooling, as they mentioned. So Toya is at, in our stores right now doing way more of the um, operation side. So okay. I think that communication and understanding like, listen, you might be doing more right now, but as soon as I'm able to, I'll kind of pick up that baggage and help um, really does help for having a strong family dynamic too for this. For sure. That, that's very insightful. Also, uh, congratulations, Chanel. Thank you. Um, all right. Now- <laughs> And Jay, it, I it, wanted to add one more thing to that yes, um, because yes, Lauren yes. touched on it, but we didn't say, we, and we all kind of touched on it, but we didn't say it specifically. And that is figuring out what lane you're going to be in. Okay. So yeah. if you're going to partner with your, your family members, your friends, or if you're just going to partner with anybody, just figuring out who's going to do what so that you don't have everybody trying to be in the same lane. So, right. uh, you know, I handle the operations. I, I, I build the stores. I'm the person primarily in, in touch with construction and, mm -hmm. and the franchise or, you know, finding the money. You know, Lauren handles everything people related. Chanel's got all the marketing. So I don't step over and say, hey, you know, I'm getting ready to post on social media right now because I know Chanel has it. Right. Um, gotcha. And I'm only, I'm only helping Lauren on people stuff because she's homeschooling. So I might, right. you know, work with the managers to do the schedule just to touch base. But as soon as she's not doing it, I'm out of that. 
because I have my own stuff to do to build and make sure things work. So I think having clearly defined roles and you can communicate will make a difference because if everybody's trying to do the same things, you're going to always be bumping heads and you're not right. really going to be as efficient as you could be with just letting people run in their lanes. I, I appreciate that. So I, I hope all the BEB family is listening. That was excellent advice from the ladies. Uh, one of the things uh, it brought to mind, um, I had a business with one of my best friends. We went to college together. We're like brothers. And the, it almost tore us apart because we were overlapping because you basically, everybody needs their own lane. We were overlapping and I'm like, dude, we can't do this. But <laughs> he liked to do the same things I like to do. So I'm more of an operations guy and yeah. so was he. And so it wasn't a good mix. Mm -hmm. And one of the things um, I always told my girls and I tell people this all the time, uh, one of the best pieces of advice I, I received was when my wife and I were getting ready to um, get married and we were going through premarital counseling uh, with our pastor. And he said something, he said, he said, guys, expectations will make or break any relationship. So if your wife expects you to do this or be this or whatever, if you don't meet or exceed that, there's going to be issues. Same thing with, and, and it goes the same way in business. So if my expectation is that my partner is going to do A, B, and C, and my partner doesn't do it, or he falls short, we're going to have issues. So uh, setting expectations is a key in any relationship, be it business or personal relationships. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Absolutely. Um, yeah, definitely. So um, we want to, I want to ask you, before we get to the hotel, uh, I want to ask you about employees. So when I owned my mortgage business, I had about 50 plus employees. And that was, I had a family at home and then I had a, a family at the office. And so each business has different dynamics in terms of your employees. The first question I want to ask you ladies is, and I'm going to start with the youngest first. I'm going to start with you, Miss Chanel. So get ready. You ready? <laughs> so <laughs> how do you find and keep good employees? So I definitely think that this is something that we've gotten better now going from one to two and now two to three. We're definitely getting better at this. Okay. Um, but we look for personality, uh, the things that you can't teach people, I think is so important. I can't teach you enthusiasm or, um, you know, things like that. So definitely when I'm interviewing, I'm looking for people who have just those innate qualities that we can't teach. I can teach you how to make a smoothie and a wrap. That's easy. Um, but, you know, having that bubbly personality and things like that definitely is what we look for. Um, and someone who is bought in, especially like when we're looking at leadership, someone who can buy into our vision. So as we mentioned, it potentially could be six uh, tropical smoothies in the area. And we have other, you know, aspirations outside of the tropical smoothies, as we mentioned with Hand and Stone and things like that. So we're looking for people who are bought into the vision and want to grow with us and can see what we see. Um, you know, I think that's important. Okay. Uh, Lauren and Toya, did you guys want to add to that? My big thing that I look for is their why. Um, I think okay. your why is really important. So whether that's, you know, if someone comes in and is like, hey, I just want to be able to, to fund, <laughs> get new shoes. It's like, you're not really invested in this. Like, you're not going to really want to come to work every week or when we right. need hours to be picked up because you don't really have a why versus someone who's coming in saying, hey, listen, this is my first job, but I won't go to college if I don't work. Right. Or I, I can't feed my children if I don't come in here. Those are the type of people that you want on your team because now you've got good qualities, as Chanel mentioned. They have a strong why and why they need this job or want money. And then I also look for outside aspirations. What do you want to do when you're not working here at Tropical Smoothie? And I think we've done a really good job with our family dynamic at work um, mm -hmm. and really trying to empower people to take this one step further. So yes, you're using this to pay for college, but you also mentioned you wanted to do hair and own a salon. Like, what does that look like? Why aren't you going to class for that? Here, right. Toy is great at this. She will live, I call her human Google, but she will <laughs> human Google you every class and course that's in GUI and be like, listen, I want you by next week to be enrolled in hair school. You said you wanted to do this. Why aren't you doing this? Or we had one guy that worked for us for a couple of years. He said he wanted to be a firefighter. She was like, why aren't you doing that? Go follow your dream and pursue. He no longer works for us. He still comes to the store like we're family. Still really, like right. mom. Um, <laughs> but I think that's so important to not only be able to find someone who has that 
you know, my why, but then also push them to do more and be better than what they, they were when they left you when they came into the organization. Excellent. Excellent. Toy, did you want to add anything to that? Um, I think they captured it. I think, you know, for this type of business, it's a little bit different where unless you are specifically looking to be in uh, food services or hospitality, you may be a little bit more transient, you know, right. and you're here just for a period of time. Uh, right. And so our goal is to make sure that for that period of time that you are with us and you are part of our family, because that is what we call it, that, mm -hmm. that we get the, the most out of you and you get the most out of us so that you get to you know, see what we're doing. And, you know, uh, particularly for us, because we have a large African-American uh, workforce right. Uh, right now in our store. And so for them to see, you know, three black women mm -hmm. running not just one store, but multiple stores, you know, it, it kind of inspires them. So, you know, they'll catch any one of us in the store. We always say Chanel gets all the, all the, <laughs> all the stuff. Oh, <laughs> they see her in the store and she gets everything but right. you know from time to time they'll uh, we'll get a text one of us or they'll get they'll catch you you know in in the cafe and say well you know hey i'm thinking about doing this you mm -hmm. know what do you think about this so this week for this past weekend for example i had i told them i, I shed a little tear because one of the uh, folks on our team she's been with us for a while she's was is working to pay for school but mm -hmm. she's an aspiring artist um vocal artist and so mm -hmm. she played for me a song that she'd been working in the studio and wow. she wanted off that weekend um, and she couldn't reach Lauren because Lauren is the, is the person who says, yes, the manager <laughs> can give you kind of off a little bit sometimes when it's too much going on. She says, I can't reach Lauren and I absolutely have to be off. I'm like, well, what do you have to be off for? She mm -hmm. says, I, I'm making a video for my song. I'm like, you're doing what? Wow. And I'm texting Lauren and Chanel, she's got to be off. Can, right. can we work with such and such to figure out what's going on? And she played for me the song. She And as soon as she cut the video, she sent us a clip. And that's the kind of stuff that's important to us. So from the firefighter to the occupational therapist to the we got a lawyer uh, on our team, uh, too. aspiring <laughs> attorneys about to go to law school. I mean, we, have, we have it all. And, and then there's a couple others who are wanting to do their own business because of being with us. And to me, right. that is better than any amount of dollars that we're going to ring up at the register. Definitely. I, I appreciate that. And I respect the fact that, that you, that you guys recognize that people have visions and sometimes it may just be a pit stop in your organization, but you're not holding them back. You're helping to propel them forward and giving them that, that good advice and that encouragement. And that's one of the things that as black entrepreneurs, uh, a lot of times, some, well, not a lot of times, sometimes we have the crab in the barrel mentality. So when I had my mortgage business, I actually helped four people start their own mortgage business, my employees, because my thought process was if there's, there's a young man or young woman that feels that they can take care of themselves and their family better than working with me, who am I to, to stop them? Let me help you do that. And so I think when we start to own and control businesses, we can give people that look like us an opportunity where they may not have gotten one before. So perfect example, if somebody told you, Hey, I'm just here, you know, I'm, I'm working hard. I'm here, but I, I really want to be an actor. Or I really want to be a singer. Some other companies may say, you know what? We don't even want you, but to be able to nurture and embrace that, I think is, is a phenomenal um, characteristic that you guys have in your business. So uh, we definitely commend you on that. It's, it's powerful. Um, before we jump to the hotel, I want to ask you a question uh, in terms of people calling out, right? What's the, what's the silliest reason you heard for somebody to call out of work? I know you probably heard some. I got one that probably is going to top all of y'all. But <laughs> is there anything crazy that comes to mind? Gosh, I heard it all. You heard it all? <laughs> all right. Well, I think with us, it's My favorite is when they get on social media after they're sick. Right. <laughs> and they're like ghosting. <laughs> Those are my favorite. So it's like, you were sick, but like, then, you know, their peers will be like, oh, but she was online last night at a <laughs> party. I'm like, wait, but she just called out saying she was sick. But their whole Instagram or their whole right. you know, Snapchat is them doing something completely different. I'm like, you would have just been better off saying I can't come in. <laughs> that's, that's funny. I had, I had one employee, and, and, and you can't make this up. What do they say? Truth is stranger than fiction. Absolutely. I had one employee. <laughs> she, was, she was my receptionist, and um, I had a, a marketing firm. And she called me one morning. She was supposed to be in at, at 8.30. 
she calls me at 9 15 and she says jay i i can't come in today because my cousin took my shoes she's wearing my shoes <laughs> and i'm like i'm thinking you only got one pair of shoes right. and, and she did i was like i never thought about it but the first response was like she took your shoes come on man but she only had one pair of shoes and I was like, oh, my God. And, and that never, because at first I'm like, come on, Raquel, go, what's going on? And then she explained it to me. I was like, man, I said, okay. You know, but that was like the craziest thing I've ever heard in <laughs> court. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so y'all got to keep me posted if something like that happens, all right? <laughs> I'm sure we have something. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to I wanna transition now um, into TLC and Choice Hotels. So I understand that you guys are in the process of developing a hotel in, where is it, Goldsboro, North Carolina? Okay. So, so now we're talking, we're taking it to another level here, guys. So how did this all come about and what was the impetus to actually get into the hotel business, the lodging business? So I can start. Um, I was actually driving one day. I think I was headed to Lauren's house in Richmond. Mm -hmm. And I saw a hotel being developed and I'm a, like, just by nature, very curious person. So I'm like, Hmm, I wonder what, what that's about. Like I had <laughs> never done any research about owning a hotel or, you know, we, we were involved already with a uh, tropical smoothie. I think we had already signed our first franchise deal with tropical smoothie. So I was familiar with franchising, but I'm like, I wonder what this whole process would look like. And honestly, that was the, the start of the ball rolling. I call my mom and I'm like, hey, like, we should own a hotel. We should, we should look into this. And she's like, okay, let's do it. And like, that's like typically her response if we call her. Oh, it's it's like, up. let's do it. And so um, literally, I want to say that we were sitting down with someone at Choice Hotels within two weeks or so. Wow. <laughs> and so um, one of the things that we always encourage other entrepreneurs to do is start before you're ready. Because when we, re when we first reached out to Choice, we absolutely were not ready. Our first job right. wasn't even open. I think it was 2015. Um, mm -hmm. But I wanted to be able to understand what does it take to own, develop and own a hotel? How much money do we need down? Um, how much is the franchise fee? What are you looking for in a franchisee? Like, how do we start to qualify to right. be the proper franchisee that you would choose and you know, all those things. And so literally sent a couple emails out to various different brands. Some brands said, ha ha, you're right. You know, yeah. like come back when your money's longer, <laughs> right. and, you know, things like that. And then there were other brands who specifically said, go to choice, like choice is the best place to kind of start, um, okay. you know, and they, and things like that. So, like I said, within two weeks, we were sitting down, in someone else's tropical smoothie because ours wasn't even open yet um, and had probably what like an hour and a half meeting with someone from choice wow. and he literally laid out the entire roadmap of like wow. how we can get from where we were in 2015 to a grand opening which was just such powerful information and mm -hmm. from there we knew exactly what we needed to do to move forward to make this idea right. an actual reality okay. that's, so. that's that's amazing. Um, question for you. Um, in terms of the actual process, when did that start with when you really started digging in to, to start the actual hotel? I know you did some due diligence, obviously, and you had to, you know, vet things out. But when did you actually say, OK, let's go hit the go button and start with the development? Was it 2015, 16 or more recent? Yeah. When did we sign that agreement? Uh, in 2018? Or 2019, or 2019. That was 2019. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe okay. I can be wrong. Though. I can't remember. It took a while to because, you know, again, you're talking about, you know, Jay for us going from, you know, that first, we hadn't opened that first one yet, and we already knew we had financing challenges, getting right. the first top of the smoothie open, and here we are talking to someone about a potential, you know, for the, the brands that, the, the gentleman we spoke with told us that we could get in. We, you're talking about anywhere from six to eight or nine million dollars. So you're talking about a three hundred thousand dollar investment versus right. six to nine million. So we're like, okay, we knew we weren't ready, right. you know, at that point. But there's so much you had to learn about it. And so 
we decided to do a slow walk with and we weren't ready to sign a franchise agreement or anything at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, I had heard about NABHood from a friend of mine and that's the uh, National Association of Black Hotel Owners and Developers. Mm -hmm. And so we decided, well, we need to link up with this group because that's going to help us learn a whole lot more faster. So we went to their conference. They have one every year in July uh, Mm -hmm. down in um, Miami. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So we went, um, got Andy Ingraham on speed down now. You can call him <laughs> for anything. He's willing to help, you know, put people together, et cetera. But we met a lot of people. Um, and that was refreshing to see that, you know, most people stay in a hotel. They ride by a hotel. First of all, most people don't even know that they are franchises. They literally right. think that the Marriott's own exactly. every Marriott they stay in. And they own right. one. And mm-hmm. only one, I think, is in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. <laughs> they own one. <laughs> they own franchise. So the first, exactly. you know, to, to do that piece, and then to see, even though we are clearly outnumbered in this space, um, you know, Andy gave a stat that I think we make up fourteen percent of the population, and we own less than one percent of hotels, um, wow. as compared to Asian Indians, which make up about one percent of the population, and they own seventy-seven percent of the mm. hotels. So that's a big, big, big gap there. And even in the African American community, when you look at that what one less than one percent, it's even more dismal than that because included in that less than one percent is a Bob Johnson who owns right. really two hundred <laughs> hotels, um, you know, or a Tom Moorhead or mm-hmm. Sheila Johnson or people who are already wealthy and owners. So right. that means we have a long ways to go in that space, and and Choice really wants to change that dynamic, mm-hmm. uh, which is why we decided to go with them too. Not only are they saying we want to change what the face of ownership looks like, but they're putting money and incentives behind it. Oh, that's, that's a blessing. And, you know, I, Lauren, Lauren is always like, I'm not going to believe that nobody else is going to be like tourists. So we're down at NAB hood and they have all these hospitality <laughs> rooms open and all the brands are there. So Chanel and I are looking at each other. Okay. Well, Lauren, if you can go and sell and get, you know, another brand to right. say, Hey, you know, we would like to work with you. Mm-hmm. go for it so she walks into it in her sales role because she's a salesperson she walks right. in she's talking to the guy and i won't name the brand mm-hmm. <laughs> sis so yeah what, what's your budget again for what you're looking to do mm-hmm. and so she gives him the range that we thought you know we could comfortably raise equity and do and right. he says yeah he should go talk to shorts and he walked <laughs> right away from her it was hilarious <laughs> Hey, there's levels to the game, but hey, there are levels. I learned very quickly there are levels to this side of business. (laughs) That's cool. Um, so when you're talking about a budget of six to nine million, let's get back on on the financing aspect again. So, what does that look like for the BEB family, the listeners? What does that look like in terms of what type of capital or equity that you have to put up up front? in order to complete a project of this size? Is it 20%, 10%, you know? Yeah, I was gonna let you. Okay, so it's gonna depend on um, what financing you go with. Okay. And so, um, I, and I'll, I'll step back a little bit. The reason that is in our budget category, mm-hmm. um, it's just for two reasons. The first is that it still falls within um, SBA funding, it falls within um, the USDA. So a lot of people don't know that the U.S. Department of Agriculture actually does business loans. Mm -hmm. And so they also finance uh, hotels depending on where they're located. Um, And that's a zip code kind of based lending thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we we chose that because we said that for our first project, it's probably a good sweet spot that we could come up with the collateral there. So you're talking about anywhere from on the low end, 10% to the okay. high end of 20%. Okay. And the second reason why we chose that is because um, we really wanted to stay in the economy to mid-scale market. Okay. Um, and while some people will look and say, oh, who wants to be in that space? Because you got to think about some of the brands that are in still in that space. It would be like the Motel 6s and the La Quintas right. and some of the other ones. But here we are in a pandemic. Right. And I really don't think everybody's rolling out to go to the Ritz Carlton or the JW <laughs> right now, but right. they still have their construction work that's still going on. You know, there's, uh, you know, workers that are, are more transient having to go on different projects and where they're going to be staying. Right. 
right. at probably one of the lower end choice so choice hotels uh, or some of those spaces so that's that dollar amount for that space it's not going to get you even a fair field right but the fair field is going to be in the 12 to 14 million dollar range okay um so if you kind of look at that so we wanted to stay in that space okay. and so now when you're talking about you know a, a six million dollar project maybe you would need 1.2 million dollars and that sounds like a lot of money mm -hmm. but this is also not the thing where we were looking to go in alone alone on this Okay. So now we're talking about building equity partners so that people can get in and be a part of the hotel ownership of that $1.2 million piece of that um, uh, uh, equity stack that we have to build up that right. they would actually be able to participate in. And so now we're talking like, you know, groups of people or individuals that could come together collectively. And then we would be um, not necessarily um, the uh, sole owners of it, but we would be right. the managing the managing partner and the folks who bring the whole deal together. Okay. And if you look at hotel ownership, this is how other ethnicities are doing this. So they're not going in and saying, oh yeah, I'm buying a $6 million hotel by myself. They're going in with family members, friends, and they're all saying, okay, I'm going to put up 10. You put up 20. We're going to, in the words that we used earlier, bootstrap this right. together to, to make this happen. And I think we have to change our mindset in the African-American community too, of we can all have a piece of ownership in this. It's not one person owning this, but we are all coming together to collectively own this one hotel. Right. And typically what will happen is they'll come together, 10, 20 families to do this one hotel. They do that one deal together. Everyone, tra they trade up, they sell it, they get out, and then everyone kind of goes on and, and does their own thing. So that's, with our first property, that's exactly what we're thinking of as well. Par, parlay that, that that's a nice that's a nice word parlay but <laughs> so um i wanted to ask you guys was one of the criteria having had some experience in the hotel bit with the advertising to hotels and, and resorts is one of the uh was one of the criteria getting a a management company on board for your approval because i know a lot of times they're property management hotel management companies that you know, they may own or, or run 40 or 50 different branches. Matter of fact, one of my good friends uh, in the DC area, he's a, a, a manager or the general manager of a, a, a property group that owns a bunch of hotels. So did you guys have to have somebody in the industry or did you have to uh, hook up with a property management group? Well, not property management, but a management company to help run the hotel? Was that a, a, a part of your deal or or you guys so want to do it? It depends um, on the room count that you're looking to do, um, the, the specific brand that you choose. Every, you know, the, the requirements are going to be different. But for us, that was a, that was a requirement for us, just okay. personally. <laughs> we, um, just being new in the industry, um, not knowing what, what you don't know as far as hotel management, the day-to-day -day operations, we wanted to have an advocate in our okay. corner. And so we started to evaluate different management companies and see you know what makes the most sense but we wanted to have someone in our corner that knew a little bit more about the operations um so but i think it, it's definitely going to depend on the room count that you're going to do and, and definitely the brand okay now what made you guys look at uh goldsboro north carolina as your destination because i know you guys are you know lauren you're in richmond chanel where and toy you I'm guys in miami. Around <laughs> where are you in miami Oh, you're in Miami. Oh, wow. And Toya, <laughs> you're in the DMV, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So what, why Goldsboro, North Carolina? So I think I'll answer that by also speaking to the power of, of educating yourself and surrounding yourself with people that have some best practices. So mm -hmm. we literally were at, at, at NAB Hood mm -hmm. and we were in a session and they were talking about um, public-private um, partnerships. Mm -hmm. And so they had, I think, the folks from Broward County and some other folks that were talking about, uh, you know, municipalities and, and the like that wanted to work to bring development to their uh, locations, obviously, because it's going to bring a tax base, it brings jobs, et cetera. And I'm from Goldsboro, North Carolina. Oh, okay. And so I'm literally in the session and I shoot an email out to the economic development um, group in Goldsboro and I said, hey, you know, my daughters and I you know, are uh, signing a franchise for a hotel. Would love to talk to you about any incentives, land you might have available, et cetera. And got a response while we were at NABA to say, oh, wow. hey, let's set something up. 
So we set up um, a call with them and, you know, just talk really high level about what they were looking to bring to the area. We talked about some of the demand drivers so that we could understand better. Um, Goldsboro is the home of Seymour Johnson Air Force Base, and that's a big driver. They have huge fuel jets and training that come there. So they have a lot of training that comes in there. They are right in the middle of a huge uh, road construction project for the next, I think, five years. A lot of demand drivers that would mean they, you know, you need some beds there right. above and beyond what they have already. And we talked to them about incentives and we've, we're not done yet because we haven't really finalized all the uh, land acquisition and everything, but we've had um, multiple presentations with Choice joining us. They actually had someone come with us on the, on, on the meeting. So we've presented in public and private to the uh, city council because they would have to approve um, the, uh, the deal and the incentives that we put forth on the land acquisition. Uh, so Choice has been a good partner there as well. Um, and you know, that's, that's how we got there, just really looking for an opportunity where, again, for the first project, when you're looking to kind of add some, some dollars on that equity side, if you can get the land acquired at a lower cost and that you know, goes over to your side as a part of equity, that's good. If you can get the, in this case, we're talking to the city and, and the county about putting up some dollars and tax incentives, et cetera, then that's good. Uh, as a matter of fact, I got an email this week from my contact at Choice who had gone with us on those um, meetings. And he says, hey, uh, is there any way you could send me all the incentives that you guys have on tap right now uh, mm -hmm. with the city? I have three or four other deals that I've told them about what you guys are doing in Goldsboro. And they hadn't thought about that. And they want to follow your model. I didn't even tell you guys this, but this was. Yeah, exactly I'm like, wow, email. that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. We had so much going on this week. I forgot to tell you that. So he wanted me to send him, you know, everything that we had negotiated to date because he wanted to share that with three other franchisees that are looking to do a deal with municipalities. So, and that all started again, right back to Andy Ingraham and NABHood <laughs> sitting in that meeting and I shot the email out right then and there. Wow. And that, that's really what started it. Oh, uh, that's, that's tremendous. It, was there ever a thought of buying uh, an existing property versus developing? And if so, what was the thought process behind the development aspect? Oh, Chanel, you can take that one. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I've probably spent, I don't even know how many hours, countless hours countless. with existing properties and existing P&Ls and all of that. And honestly, um, at that time where the market was, when we first started looking, um, it actually made more sense to develop um, okay. at that time based on the cost of, you know, the existing hotels, you know, do you buy a hotel that was built in 1986 for 6 million or do you develop one for 6 million? Who, where is the consumer going to want to stay? The 1986 hotel or the 2020 hotel, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so there was various different factors in it. Um, there was a little bit more incentive uh, potentially for us to develop with some of the incentives that Toya just uh, discussed. So, um, we're st still kind of evaluating. I mean, I think at some point we definitely will just acquire and convert because um, okay. definitely an easier process. It's going to be a faster process. You walk in and you're already making money versus you have a, a long development process. So there's definitely pros, to cons, pros and cons to each. But really the market kind of played a, um, a role in that and then just the opportunities that we were presented with. Okay. Now that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, years ago when the market was, was booming in about 2006, before the financial crash, uh, a couple myself and a couple of my uh, friends, we were looking to, to buy some uh, a hotel in Myrtle Beach. And thank God we didn't do it because we, we probably would be, you know, jacked up right now <laughs> because the market obviously went down. But we were actually looking to buy a small, I think it only had like 32 rooms. And we were looking to develop it, you know, refurbish it. And uh, we didn't even talk about a badge. I think we want to keep it independent at the time. Mm -hmm. But um, I think God was was talking to us because we, we, we were like, now, nah, you know what, something isn't right. And sure enough, about 18 months later, everything went to hell. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so but that that into and of itself, guys, what, what you're doing in terms of franchising, um, you know, the brick and mortar, and now you're stepping up to, to developing a hotel is amazing in itself. Now, I know when I spoke to you, Lauren, or both, all three of you ladies, you talked about uh, you have an online course 
that can help people learn about franchising. And so I don't know who wants to start, but if you can tell us a little bit about that and where you would go to access that information. Yeah, so we get questions, I think, all, all the time. I think we were all kind of answering on our own where we would get Chanel and I DMs on Instagram of like, okay, I'm following you and your sister and your mom. You know, I'm interested in the same type of concept or I want to do a franchise or just those calls that we're getting. I want to understand more. And so we started thinking, you know, how great would it be for us to be able to help mentor others the way we're doing already, but on a larger scale. So people who want to understand just the business itself of franchising. So our course is called So You Want to Buy a Franchise. Um, you can find it at HTTPS. <laughs> Uh, healthylivingventures.teachable.com. And mm -hmm. so the reason that we created this course was really to give people an understanding. So there's 10 different modules that are in this uh, course, okay. all taking you from kind of that beginning step of like, I want to understand what franchising is. What is the franchise or versus franchisee? Um, how to go about picking the right location, how to pick the right brand for you, how to understand a lot of the things we were talking about earlier about financing. So where can I go? What are some different options that are out there? And then we also have downloadable links in there as well. So that you, okay. to help you walk through your ideas as you're trying to go through these concepts. And I say it's a great tool because it's about an hour and a half worth of content, which a lot of people are finding what we've heard is like, okay, I'm already halfway through. I'm learning. I'm probably going to have to go back and learn more. So the nice thing is once you have access to this, you have access to the entire community. So there's chat functionality that you can leverage with Toya, Chanel, and myself, but other members who have taken part of this course as well. And then you can go back based off of where you are. So maybe today you're at that early idea of just trying to figure out if this is right for you. But in six months from now, you're saying, oh, I'm going to actually finally sit down with the brand for the first time. I need to go back to that module and figure out what were some of those questions they were saying that we should ask it to the brand. So we've, we've taken a lot of that and we've bundled it all into this um, course and we're just really excited to launch it. It's been a huge success so far and really just looking to help others do exactly what we've been able to do and more. Great. Chanel, Toya, I don't and additionally, we, uh, we put together consulting packages because uh, for some entrepreneurs, just the course isn't going to be enough. They want a little bit more hands-on you know, uh, guidance and mentorship. So we have one package where it's idea to grand opening, where we literally are going to walk you from your day one, where you're saying, I just want to, I want to own a franchise to your ribbon cutting and, uh, you know, help you find that financing and the right locations and all of those different type of things. And then there's other, you know, entrepreneurs that are saying, Hey, I just need a couple of hours of consulting. So we have different levels of packages, but, um, you know, we're really excited about the idea of being able to walk some folks from that very first start where you're feeling confused and got tons of questions to your ribbon cutting. So. Oh, that's great. All right. Toya, did you want to add anything to that about the uh, online component? No, no, they, they've covered it all. Um, okay. It's, it's a, just a thing of if we can do it, you can do it too. Um, and that's, that's really what we're trying to do to just inspire, you know, more people that look like us to go this route. Um, and this is a real easy course to go through. Um, and you're going to have questions because the first time you do it, it's like drinking from a fire hose <laughs> if you're not familiar with the franchising thing. So we're going to take you through, you know, here's everything you need to know about it. Right. And then it won't, a lot of it may not even make sense until you're in the middle. And you're like, oh my God, they just sent me this 400 page FDD. Right. What am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> and, and you can go back to the FDD module and say, okay, these are, this is why this is important. This is what I need to be paying attention to. Here's when I need to bring an attorney in and it will make sense. Or when you get to your location piece and the, and the franchisor is trying to push you in one direction or another, you can go back and we've given you all the reasons and things that you should, all the reasons why you should be involved and not just like a, let a franchise or pick something for you. Right. Um, and the things that you need to be aware of is because it all comes back down to education. I think we said that in so many different things already, the mm -hmm. more, you know, the better you'll be able to negotiate with anything. Um, the brand, the landlord. I mean, it, it's, mm -hmm. It's the, the key part is the education. So that's how the course came about because we simply didn't have enough time amongst right. the three of us to answer all the questions because we all get them. And then everyone says, I had that one quick question. <laughs> one quick question. 
<laughs> and it's never a quick question. <laughs> right, right, right. That's funny. But but no, I appreciate it. And so I always talk uh, to the BEB family about this. So right now, information is a commodity. So what you need to have, the components you need for a, a good online learning uh, aspect is, number one, obviously the curriculum, the coaching, which you guys have, have different packages if you want to do uh, consulting and coaching, and also the community. So those are the three things that any online learning component has, and you guys have that. So the BEB family, they know I preach that all the time because you can go on YouTube and, and yeah, you can get stuff, but can you get the community and also the consulting or the coaching that goes along with it? So when you guys set up, I don't know if you did that on purpose, but when you set it up, you set it up perfect. So, <laughs> cause I have about 13 or 14 online uh, training programs. And that's something that everybody told me, hey, we love the actual learning component, but it would be great if we had a community and we also could access you at some form, you know, in some form or fashion. So see, this comes from years of experience. Was that something that you, that you planned or was just something that, hey, we, this is the way we're going to do it? Did you knowingly plan the actual learning component like that? Or is it just, this just seemed to be the best way to do it for you guys? I think it made the most sense. Um, like for me, I'm thinking we really wanted to put ourselves back in the shoes of like when we started, like what would we have wanted? And honestly, we said we would have wanted a course like this. So we really planned the entire course out with that in mind of like, what would we have wanted in, in the beginning? And questions are going to come up. Maybe like right. you were saying, you could be looking at this FDD module and you're like, what in the world? <laughs> like, so we wanted to the, our students to be able to access us, to ask these questions or to communicate. And then I think the other um, part of it is how powerful it would be if you were also in community with other aspiring entrepreneurs. So right. I think it kind of naturally happened, but in a sense, you know, we were thinking of what, what did we want? Right. And you mentioned the business partner portion of it and, and finding business partners. I think Toya had mentioned the other day too of like, you never know who you come in contact with. So you might be on there taking a course thinking, I want to start this, but I don't have a right business partner. And you right. could be in contact with someone who has same shared visions as you and is looking to go in that same route. And now you have a business partner that you found through this course. So really taking the, the, the community aspect of it and putting people together so that as they're going through their grand opening or looking for a partner, you have that communication and collaboration. Right. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful, guys. Um, I'm not going to hold you ladies too much longer. I just have a few more questions because I know you're busy. Guys got a whole lot going on here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, where do you see yourselves in business in the next five years? And do you have an exit strategy at all? If, 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 you, know, if you have an exit strategy. I would say never go into business without an exit strategy. That would be one of my key lessons to anyone. When any business you start, you should always know like where your exit strategy is. So for sure, every tropical smoothie, I think that we've opened hand in stone, hotel, they all have exit strategies associated with it. But I see us diversifying our portfolio even more in the next five years. So we talked about the hotel, getting that up and running tropical smoothies, hand in stones, but what other brands fit within our portfolio for healthy living ventures and trying to add those into um, the concept and mix as well. Hopefully we can get Toya retired <laughs> and Janelle and I can be off running it. <laughs> I know she likes that answer. <laughs> yes, I love it. I'm on the beach. That's what I'm doing. That's right. Uh, how about you? What's your, what's your thoughts, Toya, on um, next five years? And, so uh, the, ne the next five years, we are, it's really still build. Okay. Um, so even though we have an exit strategy in mind, part of the exit strategy says we have a, a dollar target too. And in yeah. order to get to that dollar target, we've got to be able to build the brands that we have in terms of continuously, um, you know, delivering great products and services and getting our revenues up and also our, you know, our, our profits up for that. But then also looking to expand uh, and grow and build from a volume perspective. So one of the things that we have done in our business is, um, you know, for, I'm sure you've talked about this with some, with, with your family on um, the different certification programs and things that are out there, because depending on your business, that can be a huge shot in the arm. Right. So you might say, and for us right now in food services, you know, how do you even take advantage of being a minority or a woman owned business? And one of the ways that we did that was to, um, first get certified, you know, as, as women and minority owned, but then also look at 
opportunities in the transportation industry as um, an ACDBE, which is an airport concession DBE. And so that is the route that we're going on. We just got our ACDBE certification in October. And the thing is that we were, we were really ticked off because there was a, an RFP that came out for National Airport Mm -hmm. And it was due, I think, the first week of September. And right. so we reached out to them and said, hey, you know, we're in process. Maryland can't get us done, <laughs> you know, fast enough. Can we still submit the bid? No, you can't wow. do it. Um, and that was likely God saying, no, you don't want to be doing that right Not now. Yet. Not, Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Not right now. <laughs> yep. So we, we kind of went back and forth with, with the, um, the folks over at National and said, no, you can't do it. You, you can't be in progress. You've got to have it. So we didn't get our ACDBE until October of okay. last year. Um, but again, once again, from the education perspective, we're already out actively participating with uh, AMAC, which is uh, the That's airport. That's what I was to ask you. Yes, we yeah, are. I'm with AMAC. Uh, yeah. yep. So Lauren and I have been down to Raleigh Durham Airport with some things with them because uh, they have some RFPs coming out. So that's how we intend to to grow and build. That that is another non traditional location for us, much right. like the airport base. I'm um, sorry, the um, the Air Force bases uh, and other military bases that we're talking to as well. So we will grow not just our tropical smoothie brand, but now you know, much like financing, when you are established, people come to you. Whereas the other way around, when you're trying to get established, you know, they're trying to evaluate who their best candidates are. And right. now that we have a proven track record, we have several brands that have come to us that say, oh my gosh, you're ACDBE and you've already been operating franchises. Why don't you take our brand here? Or why don't you take our right. brand here? And those are the types of discussions that we're having right now. So that's where the bill comes in. So building from what we have right now and getting them positioned to, um, to, uh, leverage them for something else or just cash out um but then also building so that we can um expand the number of brands that we have and the locations that we have them in oh man that's tremendous so i want the beb family to recognize what what toya was talking about right now if they would have stopped when they got the bad news about the sba uh your initial loan that you couldn't get the loan you wouldn't be where you are today so fighting through that continuing to push forward. And now you're at the point where, where franchisers are coming to you guys. And that's exactly where you want to be. You want to be the, the, the one that's being poached or, or, or being chased to open different yeah. franchises. And that would have never happened if you didn't have that stick to you know, and intestinal fortitude to move forward. So BEB family, make sure you take a note of that. You got to keep pushing. You got to keep pushing. One of the things Chanel always says too, she always says, you know, you just leap and the net will appear. And I truly believe that in some cases too, because if you look at it, I mean, we've, we've leaped on a lot of these projects <laughs> and, then, and then figured it out or, you know, pieced it together too. So I think if you've got a vision, I, I mentioned earlier, no is not always a no, but sometimes you just got to take that first step. Like you just got to leap. Mm -hmm. Um, do your homework, obviously. You're not just leaping into the way. Do your homework, prepare, but sometimes you're going to be scared. Sometimes that first step is not going to be, I mean, I remember um, that we mentioned, like, we're putting our houses on the line. In these exactly. cases. That is scary, but yeah. you've got to take that leap. Otherwise, you're always going to be tied to that nine to five because it's comfortable. Right. And, and business ownership sometimes is not comfortable. You've got to take that the first step. Yeah, you got it. I, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Chanel. I was going to say, Lauren had mentioned earlier, too, like the, the hardest part is just that first one. And mm -hmm. it just speaks to what you were just saying, Jay. Like, you know, if we would have stopped at that first one with all the hurdles and all the, you know, the, the complications and things, then you wouldn't be at this place where lenders and brands are reaching out like, hey, think about us mm -hmm. on your next project. So just fight to get that first one. Do whatever it takes. Like Lauren was saying earlier, cut out stuff. If you got to cut it out to, you know, get your money together or partner maybe uh, with someone, if, if that's going to help close the gap and you guys can split later, um, you know, but you got in the door, you're in the game. In the door. Um, and that's the biggest thing, like do whatever it takes, just get in the game. And then those opportunities are going to come to you. Yeah. So it's funny because as an entrepreneur, sometimes you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable and, I, I written an article years ago called Pacified by a Paycheck. And so uh, it was on, it's on my blog. But it's crazy because there's so many entrepreneurs and prospective entrepreneurs that have great ideas, 
but they can't get past that pacification of that paycheck. And it, yeah, it's comfortable. It comes every week, every two weeks, every month, depending upon how you get paid. But, but once again, though, what are you giving up for that? So if you have a true vision to be an entrepreneur and, and to live life on your own terms, it's a trade-off. You know, you have to, it's almost like walking a tightrope. So if you ever just leave totally, and, and I think that God allows us to become accustomed to things. Now, you can become accustomed to good things or you can be accustomed to bad things. You don't want to be accustomed to bad things. But you will eventually get accustomed to walking on the tightrope without a net because, you know, that's the only way that you're going to move forward as an entrepreneur. That paycheck, if you can do it now, I like what you guys have done. You're, you're able to stay in corporate. You're a collective. You're able to stay in corporate with that security, but yet and still build. And so you got the best of both worlds there. But I think Lauren had mentioned earlier, if something happens, though, you guys are still on that path that, you know, independence. So I, I truly uh, love what you guys are doing. And I think uh, I want the BB family to understand that do not underestimate the strength of, of, of not number one family, but also of a collective that's headed in the same way. Everybody knows what direction we're going. We know the vision. We know the strategy. And we're working together. And I think to be successful in business, especially at this level, you're going to need all of those components wrapped up together. Uh, so once again, ladies, I commend you. Um, I have, you know, a wife, two daughters. I got obviously a mom. I got a sister. So I'm a big proponent uh, of sisters and supporting their business vision and whatever I can do to help you guys in the future. When you come out with a new hotel, y'all better call me, all right? We will. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jay, just for your platform. I think it's amazing to see what yeah, you're doing absolutely. and helping others. Um, and minorities, women, men, everyone, just take that leap. And it's just inspiring. So thank you. Thank you. So I got, I got two quick ones for you guys, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, and also, before we, we wrap it up, if you guys can give your contact information, I'll remind you. But the first question I have for you, uh, if you guys can, uh, each of you, give one piece of advice to prospective entrepreneurs, what would that be? And I, I'll start with mom first. Toya, what would that be to prospective entrepreneurs? Best piece of uh -huh. advice. Uh, don't be afraid to bet on yourself. There you go. Cool. Um, you know, I, I always say to people, when I worked in corporate America, I had wonderful jobs, great expense accounts, traveled all the time, made a lot of money, but I would always get upset on payday. Right. <laughs> now you would think most people would be happy on payday, right? but I wouldn't because I, would, I know that no matter what I did, that's all I was going to get. Right. You know, there was only a certain amount of paycheck, a certain amount of bonus, a certain amount of stock, and it was limited to that. You know, because I come out of technology, we got paid in stock a right. lot, and and it didn't matter. Um, you know, I had one business that I ran. I took the business at twenty four million and turned it into one hundred and nine million in three mm. years, and I got pretty much about the same paycheck. Mm. Wow. Twenty four million, one hundred nine million. That's a big difference. So <laughs> bet on yourself and don't be afraid, because I'm like, you know what, I might lose over here sometimes mm -hmm. but my upside is a lot greater than that paycheck you're talking about cool all right great advice chanel what's your one piece of advice for prospective entrepreneurs um i would definitely say one piece gosh that's hard <laughs> mine is mine's the quote that lauren had shared earlier it's leap and the net will appear um it, i guess it's similar to what toy is saying like bet on yourself if you have an idea um and you've educated yourself please don't just leap <laughs> right. educate yourself please right. but you know that you know that's something that you want to do you want to make this step you have to leap you've got to just jump out there do it scared is another quote i love to share um but the leap in the net will appear. That's been like the background of my phone for like three years. And cool. every time I'm a little nervous about a deal we're about to sign or like, <laughs> you know, something we're about to do, I'm like, leap in the net will appear. And it always does. It always, always does. The timing is always perfect. Um, the resources, the provisions, everything always aligns. And that's where your faith really comes in. Um, and I just, I thoroughly believe wholeheartedly that if, if you have something that you want to do, 
bet on yourself, do it scared, leap in the net will appear, like make it happen. I promise you, you're going to look back and those moments, like we laugh now, but right. there were days where we're like signing loan agreements and leases and we're looking around the table and we're like, are y'all sure? <laughs> like, right. y'all, everybody want to do this. We're, we're on board. And like, there's always that one person who's like a little bit more ballsy and they're like, yep, yeah. we're doing this. And That's you. That's you. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe. That does it. And so, the signing. <laughs> yeah, I'm the nervous. I'm the nervous signer for sure. Okay. Yeah, we usually have to push her a little bit, but you know, you always look back and you're like, wow, like I'm glad I overcame that fear or that you know whatever it was, the nerves, um, because you know you we're here now, and you know, so that that would be my advice. That's more than one piece, so I'm. Sorry. <laughs> that was like three or four pieces. That's all right. <laughs> we family. We're gonna let you slide with that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Lauren, how about you? I've said mine. It's no, it's not a no. I mean, I truly believe that one thing Toya has taught me over the years is like not to have, we talked about those pity parties, but mm -hmm. I'm really able to bounce back fast from those no's. And so I think you've got to be able to come back strong, hear it, pivot, and, and go the other way. Like, okay, they said no. You can have a moment. You got five minutes, three minutes, my <laughs> husband says I give them. I'm like, all right, they said no, cool. What are we going to do about it? Like, how are we going to get this? How are we going to get a yes? Thank so you. just being, you know, being agile, I think is important. Yeah. Cool. My, my oldest daughter always talks about, she's like, yeah, cry for a minute, then boss up. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. I love that one. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what you have to do. <laughs> exactly. So the last question I'm going to ask you guys, and then I'm going to ask you guys to share all your contact information for the BEB family. Uh, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start the other way this time, Lauren. I'm gonna start with you. If you had the opportunity to talk to one person, living or dead, who would it be and why? Ooh, I probably love to talk to Michelle Obama. I, <laughs> she would probably be uh, Michelle if you watch this. <laughs> I'm open for a meeting. <laughs> no, but honestly, I just commend her in so many ways. I think just from the strong leadership, I love what she's doing with the youth. Um, being a strong woman and supporting the, the black man mm -hmm. um, and uplifting him, I think is inspiring as well. So I would probably say Michelle Obama. Cool. Lauren, how about, uh, not Lauren, Chanel, how about you? Ooh, I would want to talk to like a business guru. I would think like Warren Buffett or okay. yeah. like, I feel like that would be a money, money conversation. Share uh, how he got to where he is. So I would love to pick his brain for sure. Cool. And Toya, yourself? I have so many, um, but <laughs> if you're going to nail me down to one, um, I would say I'd do Oprah. Okay. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I get a lot of that. Like quintessential boss who, oh, you know, definitely. had to take some no's and, and just decided she was going to do it her way or no way at all. And, and I really, really like that. Um, about her yeah those those are three three get great choices so oprah comes up a lot uh warren buffett this is the first warren buffett and when i've got michelle obama a couple times too so chanel you're standing out you win because you came up with somebody new now nah, <laughs> <laughs> um hey guys um before we close out if you want to share your contact information how people can connect with you also your course uh you know your course information again please do that with the BEB family. We have a very responsive uh, family here and we definitely want to support you guys in what you do in your endeavors. So if you guys can share that info, that'd be great. Absolutely. So the link again to the course is uh, healthylivingventures.teachable.com and it's not www, it's HTTPS, okay. uh, healthylivingventures with an S, dot teachable.com. You can also reach us by email if you had a question or you just wanted to connect. And it's healthylivingventures at gmail.com. Um, yeah, so that's how we would love to get in contact with you. Also on social media, Chanel, you're Chanel.grant and Instagram. Yeah. You post a lot of okay. cool. things out there. Yes. Toya, yours, I don't know your Instagram handle. Is it Miss Toya? Miss Toya Evans. Toya Evans. Yes. Miss Toya Evans. And I'm at Life with El Nicole. All right, cool. I appreciate that. Ladies, I think this was enlightening. Um, 
you know, once again, I want to thank you guys for sharing your busy schedule, taking time out of your busy schedule to share with the BEB family. Uh, is there anything you guys would like to say or I forgot to bring out during the interview that you would like to share? No. Well, did thank I hit you. it on? Yeah. <laughs> Just thank you. Thank you. Um, you. Great platform. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate you guys once again. And anytime you guys have any new developments or you just, you know, yo, Jay, we got something we want to talk about. Let me know. And uh, well, we'll bring you back on the show. And uh, like I said, uh, we really appreciate you. And and one of the things I, I must say about this that that touches me, you know, I'm a, I'm a father with two daughters. And so when I see you two guys working together along with mom, uh, that that touches me, you know, because there's a lot of families out there, unfortunately, that don't get along that have rifts and let alone, can't get along just as family, but family and doing business, good business together. So uh, mom, I commend you. So you, you raised some good kids over here. All right. <laughs> you, as my grandmother would say, you done good. So. <laughs> Her job very seriously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, guys. Thank I, you, Jay. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I appreciate you guys for coming on and once again, stay in touch and, uh, you know, I'm looking forward for more great things from, from TLC Hospitality, all right? Absolutely, we are. <laughs> Bye, cool. guys. Thank right. you so much. That was an amazing interview with Ms. Toya Evans, Lauren Williamson, and Chanel Grant, founders of TLC Hospitality and Healthy Living Ventures. Now, before I give some takeaways on this, I just want to share all my social media contact information and resource links, and then we'll do the last portion of the show and close it out. So my new book is out, guys, A New Black Wall Street, Circulating the Black Dollar Worldwide by Building Successful E-Commerce Businesses. So if you're interested in building a successful, sustainable e-commerce business, go to anewblackwallstreet.com. Pick yourself up a copy. It's $14.95 plus shipping and handling for the print version. The digital version is $9.95. Now, if you need additional assistance, I created my new flagship course titled Brand Builder Academy Elite. Just go to bbaelite.com, bbaelite.com. It is a 12-week, 12-module program where it contains, obviously, the curriculum. It has a community attached to it, and it has coaching. So there's a live group coaching call every two weeks. So go to bbaelite.com. You can register for the program there. Right now, there's a coupon. Takes off $100. It's only $97. So bbaelite.com and use the coupon code BBAELITE100 and you'll take $100 off of the $197 price. Also, guys, I talked at the top of the show about creating platforms to help circulate dollars in the black community. The first one is BeSmartByBlack.com. So if you are a black product producer that is looking to sell your products to black consumers worldwide, upload your information. It is free to BeSmartByBlack.com. Upload your product info, and now you can connect with black consumers worldwide that can buy your products. So I didn't forget about you freelancers also. So I created another site titled HireBlackFreelancers.com, H-I-R-E, BlackFreelancers.com. Once again, it is free. Upload your freelance information. What do you do? If you do something on Fiverr and Freelancer, just upload that same type of content, and now you can connect with black consumers and black business owners worldwide that are looking to hire black freelancers. So those are the two platforms. Now, let me give you my social media contact information. All right. If you got anything long, you want to reach out to me, hit me on my email, jjones at blackentrepreneurblueprint.com. That's J-A-Y-J-O-N-E-S at blackentrepreneurblueprint.com. Facebook, Black Entrepreneur Blueprint. Twitter, jjones001, J-A-Y-J-O-N-E-S, Zero zero one Instagram, J Jones for real. That's J A Y J O N E S. The number four, R E A L. YouTube. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, family, because I have additional content that comes out on YouTube that does not come out on the show. Yes, the show is on YouTube, but there is additional content. So just go to YouTube, type in Black Entrepreneur Blueprint, hit the subscribe and the like button. Also, uh, LinkedIn. You can find me there, Jay Jones, Black Entrepreneur Blueprint. Also, if you want to be included in the BEB text line for notifications and the reminders about special events, text BEB to 555-888. BEB 
to 555-888. Now, that was a mouthful. So here's an easy way to get all this information. Just go to bebconnect.com, bebconnect.com, like Black Entrepreneur Blueprint, bebconnect.com. That goes to a page on my website, and it will have a listing of all my social media contact information and all my resource links so you can connect and find everything right there, bebconnect.com. All right, let's get back to the takeaways from today's show. And there were so, so many takeaways, guys. Uh, One of the first things that I want to say is that in terms of franchising, you see what happens when you can leverage franchising to help build generational wealth. And so there's nothing wrong with franchising. Now, some of the issues I had with some franchises are some of the franchises don't even have the name recognition that warrant the cost. If you're buying a McDonald's or a Choice Hotels or like TLC Hospitality is doing in, you know, Tropical Smoothie Cafe, they're well known. Also, Hand and Stone Massage and Facial, they're well known. It's worth it. Franchises have the system already down, okay? So you're buying into the system. Um, One of the big takeaways I really want to talk about is um, when Toya was talking about when her SBA loan uh, got denied because of a previous issue with a, a previous SBA loan. And she went in the car. And at that point, guys, she could have quit. She could have quit. But no, she didn't do that. She found a way to get the job done. So as an entrepreneur, and we talked about this in the interview, you're going to have a lot of roadblocks in your way. So you have to learn how to either jump over, go under, around, through, or whatever it takes to get to the next phase. Okay, so I always talk about when I do my coaching critical tasks, right? So a critical task is a task that has to be done for you to get to the next step. And that critical task of getting financing had to be done before they move forward with the next steps. So you have to figure out what you're going to do and how you're going to do it to get through those critical tasks. Now, that was a situation, once again, where if the the ladies weren't diligent, then we wouldn't even be talking to them right now because they wouldn't have their franchises. Okay, so once again, family, it's going to be issues, it's going to be problems, nothing is going to be from zero to 100 like that. So you have to make sure that the mindset is correct and the hunger is there. So I really wanted to bring that out. Um, Also, uh, I wanted to talk about um, what Lauren said. She said, no is not a no. And there's different type of no's. No may mean... No, not now, maybe later, but no is not a no. So you have to figure out ways to get things done. So if everything was easy, guys, everybody would do it. The difference that makes somebody extraordinary is the little extra, the extra effort they put in, maybe the extra study, the extra diligence or due diligence that they put in to take it to a next level. Also, um, I, I really like what Chanel said too, leap in the net will appear. Okay, leap and the net will appear. A lot of times we have prospective entrepreneurs that are on that fence and they're like, oh, I'm scared to do this. I'm scared to do that. But I'll tell you guys, if you don't take action, then nothing is going to happen. So if you're comfortable with where you are right now, then don't worry about it. But if you're not comfortable with where you are and you're ready to make a move to entrepreneurship, then you need to leap and the net will appear. Okay, now don't just leap blindly. It has to be strategic, okay? So that's something I really like. And also, uh, Toya said something too. Don't be afraid to bet on yourself. I talk about that all the time. Who better to bet on than yourself, okay? You know, when we're in corporate America, if that's our only source of income, we're betting on corporate America. We're betting on our, our job or our company to supply us. But I always talk about multiple streams of revenue. One is the worst number. I don't care for whatever it is, you know, (laughs) well, not everything, but (laughs) when it comes to business and entrepreneurship, one stream of revenue, that's bad. I got one business, that's bad. I always talk about guys, you need to have income streams. And I talked about this, um, you know, um, indestructible income. So even in a bad economy, you need an income stream, a good economy, you need an income stream and a flat or natural normal economy, you need an income stream. So one is always the worst number. Somebody shuts that one income stream down, you're you're in trouble. 
So we got to make sure, guys, that we always look to multiple income streams. Now, one other thing that I want to bring up is that you see Chanel and Lauren are still in corporate. OK, so it is possible if you create this system where you can still work full time jobs in corporate and be an entrepreneur. And I tell people all the time, the best time to start a business is when you got a job because you, you can leverage those resources, leverage those resources so you can build, build for yourself. OK, Toya was at a stage where she decided to step out because the companies needed full time management. OK, so once again, it all depends on your individual situation. But I hope you guys really understand what's possible. And, and one of the things that I did bring up in the interview was the collectiveness or working together. Sometimes it's tough to work with family and friends. But if you find those like minded people, I always talk about being equally yoked. So in business, you need to be equally yoked. So if your partner needs the money to live when you start a business, you're not going to be equally yoked. So if you understand that this is an investment, this is a long term game, right? This is, this is a long game. But your partner needs, if you make $1,000 this week, your partner needs 500 and you don't need it, you're not equally yoked. So you need to be in the same situation so you'll be able to work together. And one of the great things that I love about this story is it's mom and daughter's and they're doing that thing, family. They're doing it. And I really respect and appreciate that. Um, a lot of times women, especially black women, don't get the credit that they deserve in terms of their entrepreneurial ventures. Yes, you have some of the Mount Rushmore, you know, uh, Madam C.J. Walker and others, Oprah like that. But the, the regular entrepreneur, regular cats like you and I, that are able to, to level up and now moving from retail uh, retail franchises up to a hotel. And with that in mind, flipping and continuing to build a hospitality chain. So uh, whatever we do, guys, we have to understand that nothing is going to happen unless we put that good work in. Hopefully you guys uh, enjoyed today's show. Make sure you follow the young ladies on social media. Continue to watch their rise. And if you're able to support them in any way or fashion, make sure you do that. So if you're interested in franchising, remember their online course. Um, so it's healthylivingventures.teachable.com. And you'll be able to take the course to learn everything you need to know about franchising. And I got to say this once again, family, uh, before we sign off, uh, you know, there's a lot of craziness going around in the world today. There's white supremacy and racism. And I talked about that last week on episode 308. And um, I just feel, guys, that we have to continue uh, to move forward. You Don't wait for anybody to give you a handout because it's not coming. We have to be self-sufficient. And like we always say, you got to bet on yourself. You got to bet on yourself and be self-sufficient. If you get some external help, that's great. But don't count on that. Determine right now or decide right now to be successful working on your own or with your coworkers or whoever you're working with, but you, you got to not wait for somebody to save you. If you're waiting for somebody to save you to ride around on a white horse and give you some money or help you out, that's not going to happen. So whatever you desire to, to attain in life, you need to start working on that right now. We aren't giving anything. Time is not guaranteed to us. So if you sit here and don't do what you're supposed to be doing, a year is going to roll by and you're going to be in the same situation. So take action. If you thought about starting that business, if this coronavirus hasn't taught you to have multiple streams of income and you lost your job or all your income, I don't know what to tell you. Multiple streams of income. You got to have it if you want to bet on yourself. All right. So I say this each and every week, family. Um, we get more and more downloads because of you, the BEB family. Please continue to spread the word. This is not a podcast. This is not a blog. This is a movement. We're trying to build an economic power base in the black community. Okay, there's no revolution without economics. We got to have it. There's no revolution without economics. So if once we can handle those economics, now we'll be able to funnel those resources into things that will help level us up. Education, media, you know, uh, supporting and building black owned businesses. Those are the things that we need to do, guys. So once again, thank you, BEB family. 
Please continue to spread the word. I love you guys, and I'll see you same time next week. Peace.